Hello, my name is Geoffrey Kahn. I'm the Professor of Hebrew at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies in Cambridge. In this video, I would like to tell you something about the fields that I research and teach at Cambridge. I shall be talking about two of my areas of interest. These are the pronunciation traditions of Biblical Hebrew and the modern Aramaic dialects. As you will see from our website, the interests of myself and my colleagues in the Hebrew language section of our department go beyond Hebrew language and include closely related Semitic languages, in particular Aramaic and other Jewish languages. Moreover, one of the courses I teach is comparative Semitic linguistics, which examines the relationship between all the major Semitic languages, in particular the relationship between Hebrew, Arabic and Aramaic. So now I want to move over to a, a, a PowerPoint presentation to show you something about my work. Um, So first of all, let's look at my, um, some of my research on the pronunciation of Hebrew, in particular the pronunciation traditions of Biblical Hebrew. Now, here you can see a, a chart showing you the different pronunciation traditions of, of Biblical Hebrew through the centuries. I should say, for those of you who are familiar with the sound of modern Israeli Hebrew, this would sound most similar to the so-called Sephardi traditions of Biblical Hebrew, in particular the pronunciation of the vowels. Uh, and the consonants would sound of Israeli Hebrew would sound most closely uh, like the um, Ashkenazi traditions of Biblical Hebrew. Now, this tree of relationships shows you that there were many different types of pronunciation traditions of Biblical Hebrew through the ages. And it's important to be aware of the fact that Hebrew was a spoken language until about the third century CE. Uh, so during the so-called Second Temple period, that is before the destruction of the Jewish Temple in 70 CE, Hebrew was very much a spoken vernacular language. And it ceased to be spoken, as I said, roughly the, the, towards the end of the second or the, somewhere in the early part of the third century CE. Now, because it, it ceased to be a vernacular spoken language of everyday life, it didn't mean to say that Hebrew ceased to be a living language it still remained alive, not only in written literary form, but also in an oral form, um, as it was transmitted throughout Jewish communities as a, in traditions of pronouncing aloud and reading aloud the, the Hebrew Bible. And it is these traditions which I shall be talking about now, yeah, very briefly. And so this chart shows, first of all, that we have a split at the top here, which happened in the Second Temple period between the Samaritan and Jewish traditions. Now, the Samaritans broke away from Judaism in the Second Temple period, and they have survived to this day, in, particularly in uh, um, Gerizim, in, uh, near um, Nablus. And they are... Um, they have a very different pronunciation tradition of Hebrew. They've been independent from the, the, the Jewish traditions for, for many centuries. Um, now, the Jewish traditions are generally divided into three different, uh, three main uh, um, branches. This is the Palestinian, the Tiberian, and the Babylonian. We needn't worry about this proto masoretic uh, uh, today. The point is that these living traditions of reciting the Hebrew Bible, the pronunciation traditions, ha have all survived down to modern times 
um, in the form of the, the the traditions of pronouncing biblical Hebrew by Jewish uh, communities to this day in various parts of the world, or at least until you know the, the diasporas uh, of, of the Jewish communities were gathered to, and brought uh, came together in in the modern state of Israel. The only tra tradition that really has ceased to exist is the so-called Tiberian tradition. Now. This is very unfortunate because it is this Tiberian tradition of pronunciation that is reflected by the vocalization signs of Hebrew as we know it, or biblical Hebrew as we know it. Now, the Hebrew Bible that we that are used in in printed form today uh, is based on. Uh, medieval manuscripts like this one. This is the, the Aleppo Codex. It's one of the most famous medieval Hebrew Bible manuscripts. And this, um, the, the vowel signs in this, um, in this manuscript, as you can see, are familiar. Those of you who know a, a little bit of Hebrew can, will be, be able to see that they look, these are the signs which are used today in printed forms of Hebrew. Now, these vocalization signs were created in the Middle Ages in order to, to reflect and record the so-called Tiberian tradition of Biblical Hebrew. And this was a, 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 just a tradition of pronouncing Biblical Hebrew that originated in Second Temple Palestine. It apparently originated from the, the actual temple itself. Uh, it is from the, 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 the high authorities in the temple. This was the prestigious tradition of the temple authorities, it would seem. And this was transmitted in, in uh, Palestine in the first uh, millennium CE, orally, down to the early Islamic period. And in the, the, the early Islamic period, it began to be written down in uh, graphic notation in the form of, of these, these signs. Now, these signs became um, fixed as, as written signs, but the, the Tiberian pronunciation tradition, which they originally reflected, then f uh, fell into oblivion, and it, it was it had it really remained uh, forgotten. Essentially, the actual oral pronunciation uh, of, for, for many centuries since the since the, the Middle Ages, um, and a lot of my, a lot of my work has uh, been involved in trying to reconstruct and rediscover this lost Tiberian pronunciation tradition of Biblical Hebrew. Now. As you see, this Aleppo Codex, this is a page of a book or a codex. Uh, and originally, uh, uh, Hebrew Bible was written in a form of scrolls as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, of course, scrolls did continue to be used all the way down to modern times in liturgical context. But in the Middle Ages, the Hebrew Bible started to be written in the form of a codex, that is the same book, a bound book. And this is what these medieval so-called Masoretic Bibles with Hebrew vocalization signs. This is, this is, the, this is the type of um, book in which they're written. They're, they're, they're bound together in the form of a codex. Now, the, co the idea of a codex came from the Islamic world. I mean, a codex was, is a pre-Islamic phenomenon, but the actual idea of writing a holy scriptures in a codex seems to have come from the Islamic world, and it's and you, uh, this here is a is a picture of a Quran manuscript, and it shows you how the all Qurans all Qurans were written in, in the form of a codex, and the uh, the idea of writing a, a codex for Jewish scripture apparently came from uh, from the Islamic uh, environment, in particular in imitation of the Quran. Uh, now this is reflected in a quite dramatic way by manuscripts such as this, which is in fact a, a Hebrew Bible manuscript, but written in Arabic script and written as a codex and written with uh, all kinds of uh, features which resemble the Qurans. In fact, um, with the decorations, with, with red ink for the vocalization signs. Um, now, in the, uh, just over a hundred years ago, uh, there was a major manuscript discovery in Cairo, known as the Cairo Geniza, and the majority of these manuscripts were brought back to Cambridge. 
and they are now uh, in the possession of Cambridge University Library, um, and they're known as the Cairo Geniza Collection. Uh, or more specifically, the largest portion of it is known as the Taylor Schechter Geniza Connection. And this is Solomon Schechter himself in the 1890s, uh, working on some of the newly discovered fragments which were brought back from Cairo. Now, this Geniza Collection in Cambridge is, plays a very important role in the research and teaching of the, um, the Hebrew Studies section. Uh, and it is very important for many fields. And it has proved itself to be extremely important for solving the mystery of the Tiberian pronunciation tradition and recovering the, the tradition of pronunciation. And it has done this in various ways. It, it's, it's one of them is that it's, it's, it's scholars have discovered in this collection fragments of um, ancient medieval, well, medieval treatises written essentially 10th century most and or sometimes 11th which uh, describe in detail how the Tiberian pronunciation tradition was 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 articulated and describing how the the, the sounds of the Tiberian pronunciation tradition were were, were articulated in the mouth like this treatise here which is a, a so-called Masoretic treatise um, and uh, Recently, I published this book. It's open access, so you can download it for free, uh, describing in de detail uh, uh, that the whole reconstruction that I've been able to do of the Tiberian pronunciation edition of Biblical Hebrew. And in fact, I, I can uh, I work together with uh, a musicologist called Alex Foreman, who actually performed my reconstruction of Biblical Hebrew according to the Tiberian tradition. And here's a very brief excerpt from that. So in, in the Middle Ages, there were also many other different forms of vocalization signs uh, and many of these different forms of pronunciation of, of vocalization signs have, have appeared in Geniza manuscripts such as this manuscript this is a manuscript of the so-called extended Tiberian vocalization where they essentially use the Tiberian signs but in a different way from the standard form and there also are uh, manuscripts containing different uh, vocalization sign systems which reflect different pronunciation traditions of Hebrew and this one is the Babylonian manuscript of Babylonian signs and this represents different not only different signs but also different pronunciation tradition um, now um, also here we have a very small fragment of a uh, a sign uh, of, a, of a manuscript containing a so-called Palestinian vocalization system, uh, which reflects another, a different pronunciation tradition. And if you recall from the chart I showed you earlier, the, the, these essentially are, these are these the two branches of the Babylonian and Palestinian. Now the Tiberian didn't have any continuations in the modern times, and it's only now just been reconstructed. But the Palestinian had its, um, descendants in the Sephardi and Ashkenazi traditions and the Babylonian and the Yemenite traditions. So, so those have survived in, 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 in modern descendants. Now the Sephardi tradition actually is a very diverse group of, of pronunciations and they can be essentially divided between European communities uh, and the, 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 the subgroups of Sephardi pronunciation in the Asian and African communities. And here I won't I don't think I'll, I'll read through all of these, but it, it shows you that they um, essentially that the variations in the different forms of Sephardi pronunciation have, be, have been influenced to a large extent by the vernacular languages of these communities in Europe, 
uh, and, um, and and Asia and um, also North Africa because um, we've got uh, of course a lot of Sephardi communities in, in North Africa. Um, now the Ashkenazi communities themselves, the um, the actual origin of the Ashkenazi pronunciation was in the, was through the Sephardic type of or Palestinian type of pronunciation, but then it, it changed. Uh, in the late Middle Ages, and it, it took, it became, it, it acquired the features which are characteristic of Ashkenazi traditions today. But the Ashkenazi tradition can also be divided into various subgroups. Um, now, let's let's hear a little bit more of uh, some of the these modern surviving traditions of, of Hebrew. Here, here is a um, a reading by a, a rabbi from Bukhara in Central Asia, and they, they, in Bukhara they have a Sephardi Palestinian type of pronunciation, but it's um, a uh, has a slightly different form than the pronunciation of of, of Sephardi traditions in Europe. Let, let's let's. <laughs> Now here's a Yemenite tradition. And finally, we've got a, here a, 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 a clip of a Samaritan reading Hebrew according to the Samaritan tradition. And you'll see that this is very different from all of the traditions we've heard so far. <laughs> Now, I I want to finish this section here by actually playing you a little clip of a speaker of of Aramaic. This is a lady I met in Georgia, uh, in Tbilisi, in Georgia, and she speaks Aramaic. But within her Aramaic, there is what we call a Hebrew component. Um, that is to say, Hebrew words and phrases contained within a modern Jewish language. And these Hebrew components are in very important, play a very important role in preserving the pronunciation traditions of Hebrew. Not, it's not only the liturgical traditions, but also those Hebrew words and phrases embedded within Hebrew uh, Jewish languages uh, over the ages. Now, this is only a very short clip, but you, you hear here too uh, some Hebrew words essentially. Kalo um, Hoton, uh, which is, of course, the Kalabe the, Chatan, the, the bride and groom. Now, but the, the pronunciation that this woman has of these Hebrew words is a very ancient pronunciation. It, it, it's, it actually preserved a lot of ancient features. So the Hebrew components of modern Aramaic dialects is also very important for preserving traditions of, 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 of ancient traditions of Hebrew. Now that brings, I want to move now into my, briefly look at some of my other areas of interest, in particular the Aramaic, the modern Aramaic dialects, and the, the, that is to say the Aramaic dialects which are spoken by Jewish and Christian communities in the Middle East. I mean, Aramaic is an ancient, ancient Semitic language. It's been attested in inscriptions for since the thousand BCE, uh, and so it's, it has a three thousand year history of attestation. And it was originally uh, a lingua franca during certainly during the Perzok or Achaemenid period, um, in the middle of the first millennium BCE. Uh, it was uh, used across the whole of the Middle East and Central Asia uh, as a language, official language. And it was a vernacular language throughout most of the Middle East at that time. Uh, now, with the rise of Islam and the passage of the centuries, the, it gradually gave way to mainly Arabic in the Middle East. 
but to this day it survived as a spoken language by Christian and Jewish communities. Now the Jews are, who spoke Aramaic were mainly in northern Iraq and west, western Iran and the vast majority of those Jews have now moved to the state of Israel. In fact, they moved there mainly in the 1950s. Uh, many of the Christians also left the area due to all kinds of dis um, upheavals and wars and, and, and massacres and terrible um, traumas over the last two, over the last 100 years, really since the sort of the First World War, essentially. But there are still a few, uh, Christian communities left there today. And, and here is just a map of some of the places where uh, you'll find uh, where Jewish communities used to live or of where many Christian, Aramaic speaking Christians live today in, in Northern Iraq and Western Iran. Uh, one of the towns where in Northern Iraq where there was a large Jewish community was uh, Zakho, and it was the famous, this the famous bridge of Zakho. Uh, also there was a Ahmadiyya was another place where there was a large Jewish community who spoke Aramaic in, in northern Iraq. This is beautiful hilltop uh, city in northern Iraq. And here's a picture of some Jews in Rwanda, so it's the far north east of Iraq uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, I have done field work in the, in the north of Iraq. Um, I've done field work actually across the whole world uh, to recording the, the, the surviving speakers of Aramaic, both Christian and Jewish. Most of, most of my fieldwork among Aramaic speaking Jews has been in Israel, uh, among the surviving communities who moved there on the descendants of the, of the migrants in the night from the 1950s. There are, in my work in Iraq, I visited some of the, the original Jewish villages where the Jewish communities uh, lived and um, they are um, one of them here, for example, we have a picture of uh, a, a, an abandoned Jewish village called Betanure in the far north of Iraq near the Turkish border. And here's the, the, the remains of the synagogue in that village. Um, now, Betanure is an interesting place because it, it bordered, uh, it was very close to a Christian village called Ernune, where the Christians spoke. Aramaic, but they, they spoke different dialects. This is often the case with, with Jewish languages, and certainly with Aramaic, the Jews and Christians, they speak the same language, but with different dialects. But one of the touching things about the situation until the 1950s was that there was a very close relationship between the Christian and Jewish Aramaic speaking communities. And um, the fact, um, the Jews and Christians used this term Kariwa, which means literally one close to you, as a kinsman, when addressing each other. Um, now, in my field work, I've, tr I've traveled the world trying to find the last speakers of Aramaic, as I said, and, and in particular, I've been very keen to track down the last Jewish speakers because they, these Jewish dialects of Aramaic now are highly endangered. And some of them appear to have become extinct. Though from time to time, a language may be, I think a dialect's become extinct. Then I've been surprised that I've discovered a, suddenly discover a speaker of this dialect, which is supposed to be extinct, but it's still surviving. And actually last year, I became very excited when I found a family in Istanbul who um, the, the elder generation originally came from a place called Bashkele in the far east of Turkey, where there was a Jewish, Aramaic speaking Jewish community in the first world, before the First World War. And um, I found the descendants, uh, this will be the, the, the daughters of the, well, the, the, the surviving elder generation in this family still spoke the, the dialect of Bashkele. And, um, and this is the picture of the, uh, uh, the, the well, the, the, the back, the ancestors of the family, as it were. And this is the, uh, one, one of the, 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 the grandmother of the family who to this day still speaks the Gawar dialect, uh, sorry, the, the Bashkela dialect, which is extremely, uh, probably she's the, I would say she must be the last speaker. Let, let's see whether we can hear her. 
So I've also traveled to Georgia um, in the Caucasus where there is a, a various Christian communities speaking Aramaic. This is a, a village, a picture of a village called uh, Kande in just north of Tbilisi. Um, and they migrated there really about 200 years ago uh, from, from Western Iran. Um, but they are speaking a very endangered form of, of, of Aramaic. And here's, here's me just uh, recording one of the older speakers in the village. So this lady here is telling me a story. Um, and this reflects another aspect of my fieldwork is that the, when you do linguistic fieldwork like this, you also record a lot of folklore, a lot of tradition, oral literature, and a lot, all of this oral literature is being forgotten as well. So we are, you know, this, this documentation work is also very important for, for more than simply linguistics, it's culture in general, it's preservation of culture. Now, one of the tragedies of the Middle East is that uh, of, of the Aramaic speaking communities is that, as I said, for over a hundred years they've undergone all kinds of upheavals, and the Christian communities in very recent times have undergone a major upheaval due to the invasions of ISIS, uh, Islamic State, in the in the region where the Islamic State essentially uh, destroyed uh, and occupied most of the villages in the Mosul Plain where the Aramaic speaking Christians were found and they it's caused a massive refugee crisis and destroyed their villages and this has high this has caused high endangerment for, for the most of the dialects of these villages because in many cases it's unlikely that the villages will ever be able to be re-established um, and these are some of the pictures of the refugees uh, two or three years ago in, in, in Iraq and um, so one of the things I've been doing with my research team over the last few years is to actually make an effort to help the local Christian Aramaic speaking communities who, have, who are still live in Iraq, and in particular the younger generation, to become involved in the process of, of preserving their language uh, by taking an interest in their language, which is an in all cases, essentially, their languages are just a vernacular language of, of spoken in many different dialects. I've been trying to help them, first of all, to learn how to write down their language, to transcribe it, in order to preserve it and help them to record their, the elder generation. And um, here are a few shots of a, a workshop that I and my research team ran uh, last year in northern Iraq with. Uh, some of the members of the communities. Um, and here we are at the end, this was in Dahok. And one of the uh, things I would always say to the people at this uh, workshop, and this uh, is a good way, I think, to, to close this little presentation, is that is, your heritage is in your mouth. So I, that, I hope you've enjoyed that, this short uh, talk about some of the work that which I do and I would be very happy to be in touch with anybody who interested in the kind of things which I've been talking about or any of you who would be interested in studying with me in Cambridge. <laughs>